who never forgets His love is never ending His mercy will pray And day after day after day He stays right beside us Always working on things For the good of those who love him Knox. I am part of the student ministry here at Mayfield Road. Welcome, welcome to this time of worship. If this is your first time joining us, or if you have any prayer requests, please fill out the connect card found in the pew rack in front of you. You may also go to mayfieldroad.org connect to access the card online. For you, for you watching online, a link to that card is provided in the title of this post. We also want to thank you for your continued financial support of the ministry here at Mayfield Road. There are three ways you can give, through our website, your bank bill pay, or in person by dropping it in the offering boxes located outside these doors and throughout the facility. Thank you again for joining us in person and online this morning. We invite you to continue worshiping with us.
We enjoy having them on Wednesday nights and invite any others to come. Let's stand as we worship together and sing Christ is Able. Now? Yes. <laughs> you know, it's always better when you turn things on. Um, well, boys and girls, thank you so much for leading us in worship this morning. We really appreciate you. Yeah. And we appreciate Lee and, and Jeanette leading them. Uh, you know, boys and girls, when we come together, what we do is we're honoring God with our song. When you sing, you're giving your praises to God, and this morning you are leading all of us in that. And so we appreciate you serving us. And uh, that's one of the things that we do as followers of Jesus is we serve God and we serve others. Now, another group in our city that serves are our police officers. And you may not know, but this weekend is National Faith in Blue Weekend. And this is where uh, churches all across our country are honoring the police officers in their city that serve us. And today, we're privileged to have Chief of Police Alexander Jones and Lieutenant Dylan Ekstrom here with us this morning. And so if you would give them a, a round.
always have Lieutenant McGee with us every Sunday and are grateful for her service as well. You know, we, we appreciate all of the members of the Arlington Police Department because one of the things that they value is what they call community policing. The idea that we want to build relationships, we want to seek peace and justice together by partnering with one another. And so it is an attitude of service, and, and we appreciate that about you guys. And uh, part of what we're called to do as followers of Christ uh, is to seek peace and justice in the place where God has us. That's one of the things that, that we see. Even when the people of God were led into captivity, into Babylon, into a foreign land, they're told to pray there for the flourishing of the place where God has them. And so that's part of what we're called to do as followers of Christ. And I'm grateful that here in our city that we have a good working relationship with the police department. And we want to continue to pray for them because their, their work is not easy. And uh, we, we want to continue to pray for the men and women who serve. Uh, many of them, brothers and sisters in Christ, that are striving to serve uh, in their vocation. And like all of us, uh, doing so is a challenge at times. They have unique challenges. But this morning, we want to pray for uh, our police department here and then for those all across our country. And so if you would, join me as we pray. Father, we thank you for how faithful you are, how good you are. And Father, we thank you for the way that in your wisdom, you have... You have established order in our world. God, that, that our world would be a place where we can live and flourish, where we can have healthy communities. Father, because of sin, it doesn't always go that way. But you work through men and women to, to lead so that we can build healthy communities. We can build cities and neighborhoods that are that are healthy places. And God, as fo your followers, we long to see peace and justice done. God, we long to live in neighborhoods and cities and communities where, where we love and respect one another, where the good is done regularly. Father, service is, is one of the things that we're called to do as your people, and it's one of the things that's a hallmark of, of being a follower of Christ. And so we, we recognize that as a value we hold up. And so we thank you for the men and women of the Arlington Police Department who serve our city and serve the well-being of our city. We pray that you would continue to guide them in your ways. God, that they would seek what's right that they would seek to be peacemakers. God, that in every decision and everything that's done, God, that they would seek your wisdom. Father, we pray for your protection over them and their families. It's not an easy call. But Father, we pray that you would show us as your people how we can partner with the civic leaders in our city to bring about a good and healthy relationship, a good and healthy community, and that it would be done to honor you. Give us wisdom to know how to do that. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your, for your love and kindness. God, the way that you work in our lives. God, you allow us to use our lives in a part of your work. Father, that's more than what we deserve. And so many times it's so far beyond anything that we're capable of in our own power, but you in your kindness and your love and your goodness, you take the little bit we have to offer and you multiply it and make it enough. God, like the little boy with his lunch, it was enough. In your hands, it was enough. Father, we pray that our lives would be an offering to you. And so continue to mold us by your word this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some of you will know the name of Trudy Ludwig. Uh, she's a children's author. And uh, she writes a book about Brian, the invisible boy. And she tells his story. Brian is a good guy. He goes to school with lots of other boys and girls, but none of them seem to notice him. The other boys and girls at his school, they like to play games together and laugh and carry on. But they never ask Brian to play. At lunch, they like to gather around the table. They tell jokes and they carry on and always have a lot of fun together, but nobody ever talks to Brian. And from time to time, one of the kids will have a birthday party that they're excited about, and they, they are looking forward to all weekend, and then afterwards, they talk about it for the days afterwards. But Brian never gets invited. He's just kind of invisible. Some of us have probably felt that at times. We're continuing our series this morning on making sense of our emotions. And over the last few weeks, we've said that our emotions aren't a flaw of humanity, but they're part of God's intentional design for us. And we understand that by looking at the Bible and seeing the life of Jesus. Because Jesus experienced and expressed a range of emotions. But the thing is, he always did that in a way that was obedient to God. He, he didn't veer off from God's direction in any way. And so we understand that our emotions are something that God has given us and we can learn to experience and express them in a way that's obedient to God, a way that's good. And so the big idea that we've been coming back to over and over again in this series is we don't want to bury our emotions. We don't want to ignore them and pretend that they're not there. And at the same time, we don't want to surrender to our emotions and whatever impulses may come with them. We don't want to just go wherever they lead us. But instead, we want to disciple our emotions. And what we mean by that is, we want to learn to experience and express our emotions in a way that's consistent with who we're called to be as followers of Jesus, in a way that's obedient to God. And so we've been talking about how to do that the last few weeks. Uh, we've talked about how to do that when it comes to fear and when it comes to sadness. And today, we're going to talk about loneliness. Now, in the last 20 years or so, there's been a growing amount of research that's been done in the area or field of loneliness, the study of loneliness. And a big part of that is because there's just a sense that it's a growing, like, epidemic. People are dealing with loneliness in just kind of this cascading wave. Uh, Harvard professor Robert Putnam noted in his classic book, bowling alone, that by virtually every conceivable measure in the U.S., our social connectedness has eroded steadily and sometimes dramatically over the past two generations. Now, that book was written 20 years ago. Do you think it's gotten better or worse? Yeah. Yeah. More recently, uh, John Cassiopo, a social psychologist at the University of Chicago, has been leading the research on loneliness. And he's uh, seen the link or highlighted the link between loneliness and 
physical health. And uh, he's found that actually loneliness affects our health. It raises the risk of blood pressure. It raises the risk of heart disease. It has been correlated. There's a correlation between loneliness and longevity of life. In fact, one study noted that people with bad health habits, that's like you know, eating bad diet, not working out, smoking, people with bad health habits, but strong connections, strong, strong relationships, they lived longer than people with good health habits, who eat well and exercise and don't smoke and all that, with good health habits, but who are socially isolated. So when reading that study, Pastor John Ortberg concluded that it's better to eat Twinkies with friends than broccoli alone. <laughs> There's something for you to take and chew on over lunch. All right. Now, when we experience parents, I'm sorry for that. That probably didn't help you. Um, now, when we experience loneliness, sometimes we feel like Brian, the invisible boy. Sometimes we feel like nobody around us notices us. And boys and girls, can I just point out that probably every single one in this room has experienced that at one point or another, okay? And so when that happens, just know you're not alone in that. But you know, you can also be the center of attention and have people constantly around you and still feel alone, right? That's because loneliness isn't just about what's going on around you. It's, it's a lot broader than that. It's about what's going on in us too sometimes. Loneliness is not just about wanting people to be near, to be in proximity, Loneliness is about longing for connection, for people to actually know us and be in relationship with us. And so let's go back to our, our definition of emotions that we've been looking at the last few weeks. We've said that emotions are your brain's interpretation of what's going on in and around you based on your beliefs and values to move you to action. And so sometimes we feel lonely because of what we see around us. There's you know, nobody with us or nobody in proximity to us. Sometimes that's what prompts loneliness. But other times, it's because of something in us. We feel like even though there are people around us, maybe they don't understand us. They don't quite get us. Or we don't feel like they really see who we are, like we're really valued by that person. Sometimes... It's not that we don't have people who talk to us and hear us, but there's a missing connection. The connection isn't what we need. Now, all of us have kind of this gauge of the level of connection that we feel like we need, the level of close friendships, and that can vary from person to person. We all have some sense of the level that we need, and when we fall short, when that need for connection falls short, that is what triggers that feeling of loneliness. It's a sense that I don't have the number or depth of connections that I need to have a flourishing life. Here's what we need to understand, though. God gave us the emotion of loneliness for a purpose, right? Every one of these emotions are from God and there's a purpose behind them. And so remember, what did we say? Again, the definition. Emotions are our brain's interpretation of what's going on in and around us based on our beliefs and values. Why? It's not a trick question. <laughs> to move us to action, to do something, right? Right? Loneliness is given in order to move us toward community, toward connection, toward relationships. There's a purpose behind it. It's given to move us toward seeking out the connection that we need and we long for. What we understand is loneliness is like a gauge going off. It's like the fuel gauge in your car saying, low, you need to fill up. Loneliness is saying the connections that you need are low. You need to do something about it. Now, the Bible doesn't address loneliness directly as much as it does like other emotions. 
But it does talk about our need for connection almost from the very beginning, from the earliest pages of the Bible. In fact, the very first thing that God says isn't good, what is it? It's that man is alone, right? God sees Adam alone. He says, that's not good. And so he created Eve. Now, we understand from reading the rest of the Bible that this isn't just about marriage, but it's about a need for connection. 1 Corinthians tells us that you know, God hasn't called everybody to be married. And in fact, for, for married folks, let me just say, our spouse is not to be our sole source of connection. That's more than one person can bear. We're not all called to be married, but every single one of us are designed to live in community, to have deep and meaningful relationships that shape us and that challenges us. And so we all need that, and the Bible highlights the value of that in a few different places. Uh, a, big, a big passage is in Ecclesiastes 4. And so if you have your Bible close, let me ask you to go ahead and turn there. And boys and girls, if you're following in your one big story Bible, that's going to be on page 651. Now, Ecclesiastes is written by Solomon, or maybe by someone commissioned by Solomon, to try to make sense out of life and how things work. It's almost like a mystery book, because he's trying to find out, how do we make sense of life? And he goes around and he sees a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense, and he's just trying to kind of piece it together. At the very end of the book, he's able to make sense of life, but along the way, he makes a lot of different observations about life. And where we pick up in Ecclesiastes 4, he's going to look at some observations, especially when it comes to relationships or friendships. And so we're starting in verse 7. And he says, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. This is his way of like, starting a new passage, a new, a new observation. He's saying, look, here's something I saw that just didn't make sense. Verse 8, he says, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. For whom am I toiling, he asked. And why am I depriving myself of enjoyment? This too is meaningless, a miserable bus business. He's observing here this guy who's out working in the field, and he's like just killing himself to stockpile his resources, stockpile wealth. But he doesn't have a friend, he doesn't have an heir, he doesn't have anybody that's going to share in that with him. And Solomon's just observing this thing. That doesn't make a lot of sense. He's like brutally just going after it, working himself to death, and there's nobody to share that with. He doesn't have anybody in his life. That's, that's not a good thing. And he goes on and has some more observations just about how we need each other and we need connection. Starting in verse 9, he observes that two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. So the writer's highlighting how Friendships, relationships, people in our lives, they benefit us. They help us. Now, he's mostly focused on physical benefit here, you know, helping advance the work or protect each other, or, you know, care for each other in, in various challenges. But it doesn't take a whole lot of imagination to think beyond that and to see how relationships, friendships, benef benefit us in far more ways than just physical safety. They enrich our lives in all sorts of other ways. Friends give us encouragement when we need it. They give us advice. Friends celebrate our wins, and they help us cope with our losses. Any Sooners out here need some friends today? <laughs> um, friends help us in many other ways. They call out the best in us. Friends help us see things from a different perspective sometimes, something we really need. 
Friends, help us have fun and enjoy God's good things and not take ourselves so seriously sometimes. And man, do we need that. Friends, benefit us in all sorts of ways. God created us for community. God created us for deep, meaningful friendships. And so one of the things that loneliness does is it moves us to action to seek out deep, enriching friendships, to seek out community. And so when we experience loneliness, instead of bearing it and pretending that it's not there, and instead of surrendering to it and throwing some sort of a pity party, instead, what we ought to do is we ought to let loneliness move us to action by seeking out deep friendships, by seeking to cultivate deep friendships. Now this is what Invisible Brian does. If you go and read his book, he reaches out to a new student who comes who seems just as lonely as he is. And he starts to share things with him and, and learn about his background. And they start to grow a friendship together and hang out together and start to support each other. And that's what loneliness often calls us to do. That's part of what God has given it to us for, is to move us to cultivate deep friendships. Now, that, that word cultivate is a, a gardening term, a farming term. And if any of you have ever had a garden, garden, you know how this thing goes. You break up the ground, you get the soil all ready to plant, and you basically create the conditions for a plant to flourish there. But you know how it goes. Sometimes you do all that, and plant's going to do okay. Sometimes you do that. Not much happens. It just kind of struggles. Sometimes you cultivate the ground, and the plant that grows just absolutely explodes. It just does great. It produces like crazy. And that's really how it works with friendships, too. We, we cultivate the ground. What we do is, uh, you know, you spend time with each other. You get to know each other. You get to know each other's stories. You listen to one another. You hang out. You get to, like, build some trust and pursue shared interests together. And sometimes that friendship develops, but it, it just kind of, it doesn't grow past a certain level, right? But then sometimes you do all that, you cultivate that relationship, you spend time together, you hang out, you talk, you listen. And it just, like, grows deeper. It's like you get each other. And you spend time not just talking, but like listening to their hopes and fears and maybe even some of their hurts. It grows into a deep, life-giving friendship where like you lean on each other in the good times and bad. And that friendship grows over times and decades later, I mean, that's just like a gift to you, right? If you have those deep, life-giving friendships, you know what a gift that is. And it's one of these things that, like, it's not automatic. We cultivate the friendship. Sometimes it takes root. Sometimes it just really flourishes. It's not something that you can manufacture. But it does always require effort and patience and a little bit of vulnerability on our part. We all need that. And so that's why sometimes loneliness is driving us or pushing us to cultivate those friendships. But sometimes loneliness is pointing us to something even deeper, a deeper connection that we need. As followers of Christ, we talk a lot about having a relationship with God. That's familiar language to us, but that's not always something that we live out so well, right? We talk about having a relationship with God, but sometimes it still seems like we just that's a, a foreign term. Like, some people get that. Some people seem to have a, like a life-giving connection with God. But it seems really, like, inaccessible at different times to us. And the fact is, sometimes the reason why we're seeming lonely, the reason why we feel that, it's because the sense of connection we're looking for is beyond what the other people in our lives can offer us. And that's because, really, there's something, there's a connection that only God can offer because only God can see us fully for who we really are. 
I mean, think about this. Even the, the people closest to us, like the people that know you the best, there's still a limit to how much they're able to know of your background and your history. There's still a limit to how much they're able to see of you know, your life each day. You know, we all kind of see each other in pockets, right? Nobody knows every part of our thoughts and feelings and values. No one knows all of who we are except our maker, except God alone. And he's the one who sees every corner Every thought, every bit of our history, the stuff that we don't even want to talk about, he sees it all, he knows it all, and he still longs for a deep connection with us. David wrote about like, how God knows us, how God connects with us, and knows us better than anyone else in Psalm 139. Uh, this is an incredible passage. As David is just reflecting on what it means for God to know us so fully. And this is what he says. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, Lord, you know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Since such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. David marvels at how God sees us like no one else ever can. He sees us he knows us. Every part of us. And still, he loves us. And he invites us to relate to him. To be in a relationship with him, not just in words, but in reality. Something we live out each day. He invites us to relate to him and to like, connect with him as we go throughout our day. To share our concerns with him at the beginning of each morning. And to listen and look for his wisdom and direction as we go throughout our various days. We make our different decisions. As we find encouragement from him and support from him. That's what he offers us. He offers us a real, life-giving, flourishing relationship. Where we connect with him in the way that we can't with anybody else. Where our soul is known and seen and cared for. It's at those times when we're longing for something that we can't get from anybody else around us that loneliness is pushing us to connect deeply with God. And that is something that he offers to each and every one of us. And of course it begins, it begins with putting your trust in Jesus and accepting what he offers us when he gave his life on the cross, his death and resurrection to pay for the penalty of our sin so that guilt and shame can be removed and we can be right with God. But it continues. That's just the beginning. Putting our trust in Christ. When we're reconciled with God. That's just the beginning. Of growing to know him. And live for him. And walk with him day by day. He invites us to connect deeply with him. Through reading the scriptures and prayer. And learning to reorder our lives. So like following him. Where every part of who we are. Is shifted and changed. So that it's in alignment. 
with who God's calling us to be. And so we listen to his promptings and his nudges that he gives us throughout each day. This is something God offers to each and every one of us. Because what he offers is the kind of connection that we need. Scripture reminds us that as followers of Christ, we are never alone. And so when loneliness creeps up, don't bury it. Don't give in to the pity party. But rather, disciple that emotion. Learn to express it by seeking out either, do I need to cultivate some deep relationships? Have I gotten a little lean in that area? Have I started to withdraw maybe from the people around me or not connect in the way that I need to? Or is this a longing for something that no one around me can offer? No, no other person can meet that need. Is this loneliness actually a longing to connect deeply with my Father who knows me and loves me and longs to speak good things into my life? That's how we disciple loneliness. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for, for how you love us. God, that you don't leave us on our own. For Father, you created us for community and you have made yourself available that we can know you. Father, I pray that if any here have not yet taken the first step to put their trust in you, to experience the forgiveness and the renewal that you offer, the life that you offer to all who turn to you, God, that you would draw their hearts close and that you would show them your invitation is wide open. Father, for those of us who have followed you for a long time, but maybe there's just a sense of distance between us. Maybe we're not really sure how to pursue the connection that you offer, that deep, life-giving relationship that you provide. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning and that you would show us how to pursue that, how to, how to lean in to seek after you and listen for your voice. Father, show us, show us how you have made yourself available to connect with us. In Jesus' name. This morning we're going to close our time together by singing, reflecting on our God who knows us, our maker who loves us deeply and who longs to connect with us. And this morning, if, if there's just a sense that, first of all, that you need to begin that relationship, here's what we'd ask you to do. Uh, on your connect card that Knox mentioned earlier, there's a spot where you can mark, I want to become a Christian. And you can mark that. We will follow up with you and answer any questions you have, kind of help you find your way in that. Help you begin that relationship. Or maybe you began your relationship with Christ a long time ago, but, but relationship is just not the word for it. There is a moment, but you don't really know where to go from here. You just know you need you need more. You need to connect. God offers that. And so if you would just mark on there like a prayer request, just say, I want to connect deeply with God. We can follow up with you and talk about what your next steps might be. Pray with you, help you 
you know, find your way. But that is God's offer to all of us. He's not a distant father, but he's one who's near. And so this morning as we sing together, maybe your prayer would just be, God, show me how to connect deeply with you. Let's sing this morning. church family our father does hear when you call and so don't hesitate to call out to him and don't hesitate to ask say God I want I need more there's a loneliness here that I need you to fill he's able to do that Well, thank you again for being here with us. If you filled out a Connect card or if you'd like to learn more about joining our church, you can mark that on the Connect card and place that in the offering box on your way out this morning. We'll follow up with you. If you have a prayer request, I'm going to be down here at the front at the end of our service with some of our deacons, and we would love to pray with you about whatever concerns are on your heart this morning. A few announcements for us today. First, uh, remember our fall festival is coming up in just a few weeks going to be Friday, October the 28th from 6 to 8, and there are a couple of different ways you can help. You can sign up to host a a trunk or treat if you want to decorate your car. Um, You can do that, or uh, we'll be taking donations for individually wrapped candy, Cokes, drinks, all that, and so you can drop those off in the uh, the bins around the church. I guess our kids are doing something, so (laughs) all right. Either that or it's a mutiny, one. (laughs) All right, so um, also don't forget that our Feed the Kids ministry at Lynn Hale uh, has asked us to provide coats uh, for the boys and girls there at the school who don't have coats otherwise. And so we've got our our big box out in in, uh, Break Hall, uh, the Great Hall right here. And so you can drop those coats off. Uh, One thing they ask is uh, no, they have to have a zipper. So no hoodies without a zipper. And so if you can bring uh, new or gently used and clean coats and drop them off there, uh, that's a great uh, way we can serve our community. Uh, Also, uh, finally, don't forget we have another great, exciting ministry opportunity starting this next week. We've partnered with the Tarrant Area Food Bank to be a mobile pantry unit for them. And so this coming Saturday, uh, we're going to be serving our neighbors providing food through the Tarrant Area Food Bank. This is a great ministry for our church because it's the food all comes from them. We're providing the manpower and the hands and feet of Jesus to love and care for our neighbors. And so um, if you want to learn more about that, even if you're just like interested and want to hear more, we're going to have a meeting right after the service in the choir room. 
And so you'll want to stop by there so that you get the information that you need. That's going to be every third Saturday of the month going forward. And it's going to be from 7 to about 11.30 or noon. Um, one thing you can do if you're not able to participate, uh, we need everybody to bring your grocery bags, like the little plastic bags you get. If you can recycle those to us, that helps us out a bunch because as folks come through, they're going to need something to carry the food away. And so we appreciate your help with that. All right, I think that's it. So I'm going to hand it over to Lee and our fantastic boys and girls. Oh, wait, one more thing. One more thing. Sorry. Um, uh, Chief Jones and Lieutenant Ekstrom are going to be here at the front uh, after the service. Please come by and thank them for how they serve our community and uh, encourage them because they do a lot for us. All right, didn't these kids do great this morning? Yay. All right, we want you to stand and join us and sing a little part of Our God is Faithful. Thank you for being here this morning. We'll see you soon. Bye.